Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, lovely people. This is Marie Alessi with yet another Upsparrow Brief interview. And today I am so deeply touched to have this beautiful woman next to me. And I'll tell you in a minute why. Rachel Tenpenny and I are in the same mentoring group. And I love when things just happen in a way where you're like, this was meant to be uh, that I meet you. I met your beautiful sister first and then I met you. And today I'm so, so I want to say excited, but it's almost like a, a too hyper word for what's to come. But I'm really um, looking forward to introducing you to our audience. So as I said, Rachel and I have got uh, the same very, very incredible mentor, Liz Benny. And uh, today I want to share Rachel's deeply touching and so beautiful story with you. So Rachel, without further ado, would you do us the honor and introduce yourself to the audience, please? Uh, well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And <laughs> I agree with you. I like when there's sort of kismet in life where we just mm. cross paths. And I think yeah. that's also sort of our our testimony, our path as grievers is there's so many of us out there actually. And we're often mm. wandering like unlabeled and we don't know. And then under certain mm. circumstances, we realize we're like, oh, you're a griever and I'm a griever. And not mm. that I walk around with that label, but it is part of our past. It's part of our history. That's yeah absolutely moved us in a certain direction and so to be able to connect in that way and say like we're grievers but we're also healing and moving and being and all the things that are mm. so important after loss but yeah. my name is Rachel Tenpenny uh, my sister Crystal and I started a company called T-Motions over 12 years ago now where we created a line of herbal grief support teas that are intentionally mm. blended with powerful healing herbs like adaptogens and superfoods and nervines and tonics to support people through the grief process. And the reason mm -hmm. why we even created these teas was because I was grieving. My baby daughters died in 2008. Ellie died when she was seven days old and Aubrey died when she was 13 days old. And mm -hmm. pretty quickly within a matter of a handful of months, I realized that if I didn't have more to support me that I didn't know what I was going to do. There was a mm -hmm. lot of ambiguity around grief, a lot of mixed messages. Like, I know this sounds so strange. This is back in 2008, which shouldn't seem that long ago, but it was in mm -hmm. the grief world. <laughs> for any yeah. of us who've been grieving yeah. for any length of time, it was like, it almost feels archaic what was happening it's back such then. such a it was, timeline, yeah. Something yeah, so much has like changed. It's been forever, and then other days you feel like that was only yesterday, and then it's yeah, yeah it's like a blink so or an eternity. Right to each other. <laughs> mm, exactly. At the same time, yeah. a blinking eternity. Um, that's that's yes. a good description for the grief world. A blinking um, eternity. Yeah, um, yeah. So we created this line of teas to support grievers. Well, originally it was to support me. We didn't even know we would yeah. be, you know, create yeah. a business and offer our teas. Be before other we go too much into that story because I, I really love how that uh, came out of your adversity I would like for you to start at the beginning if that's okay so I'd like for you to share um, if it's okay your family story where your twins your firstborns and and how how did this all unfold to take you where you are right now maybe you can take our viewers a little bit onto your timeline if that's okay yeah, well, I was young. I was 28 years old and I had a two and a half year old son mm. and a husband who's now my ex-husband. He's I'm no longer married to him. And all we were doing was adding to our family, right? So mm. we decided our son turned two and we thought we should, you know, I wanted more kids. It wasn't, you know, it was exactly, we're just, we're just going forward in life. And yeah. I think my story is not unique. I, I think there's many, many people that are just moving forward in their life and they're just mm -hmm. taking the next step and they're just mm -hmm. making the next move. And then blam, oh, yeah. something gets in the way and breaks your heart. And um, I found out that I was pregnant with twins uh, when Dustin was just two years old. And I remember mm -hmm. the nurse telling me, be still for a second. I want to make sure that there's not <laughs> a third. And thinking like, oh my gosh, what would I, you know, what would I do? And having no idea what I was headed into. And 
long story short and it, and I will be honest I think this is the story of so many other people like this is unfortunately not a rare story it's a heartbreaking story mm-hmm. and it absolutely devastated me but I'm not the only one um, but mm-hmm. my girls were born early mm-hmm. in 26 and a half weeks uh, which wow. is both early enough you know, to have a a not good outcome, but also late enough where you might have a good outcome. Mm -hmm. So we were straddling that line of like, this could go really well and it could go really poorly. And long story short, they um, both got very sick. We did not have a situation of a lot of good moments. It was pretty much, you know, the last good news I got was I was told that they might not even be alive when I wake up, but they were. And that was pretty much the last good news we got these two little tiny but perfect little babies but then life outside the womb was just too hard for them and ellie died when she was seven days old and she she forced our hands she decided her own fate she was my baby girl who just said i'm out you know enough is enough for me but aubrey fought harder she was my my feisty um my you know, she was Henri from the beginning, which was interesting because even in my mm. belly, I could tell one was Henri and one was pretty Aww. chill. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> and then they were born, and I was like, "Oh, it I makes so that. much sense." Um, mm. But we ended up actually removing Aubrey from life support, which is a whole different experience. If you've ever had a situation where you've had to decide for someone else, yeah. and, and that was this enormous burden I felt as their mother that my decisions were what they were going to have to live with and Mm -hmm. so I needed to be very very careful about the decisions I made and be very careful about how I decided what I wanted versus what they needed and my responsibilities as a mother became very real very Mm -hmm. fast and I was no longer just trying to make sure that my son went down for his naps and didn't drown in the bath and got enough fruits and vegetables each day right like all of a sudden we were talking about the very well-being and quality of life of two little girls who could not choose for themselves. And at the end, yeah. neither one of them survived. And we had a funeral. They were both buried in the same casket. Yeah. And I remember watching them. Yeah. And what you had to fight for, believe it or not, in the state of California, that's not something that's a normal wow. thing. And I had to fight really hard. I believe very strongly that if they were in the same womb, they should be buried in the same casket. Um, But I also look back on that day sometimes and it's such a blur, right? We really, Mm. that out of body experience, that term Mm. is very, at least for me, I'll speak in my own experience. It was Mm. very real for me. I remember feeling like those two weeks that my girls, between the time they were born in the hospital and died, I almost felt like I was a fly on the wall watching my own life. Yeah. And I saw myself going through the motions and I saw myself making the decisions and I saw myself trying to spend time with the girls and mm. also care for my son and also heal from my C-section and also manage family. Yeah. And it was a blur and it yeah. took me a while to leave that place of watching myself mm-hmm. and get back yeah. into my body, back into my life and actually figure out how to move forward in my grief. Yeah. I, I'm so grateful that you share this so open and honestly because this this whole out of body experience, I often refer to it as functioning mode. You know, you just go and it, it's almost like a tick list. What's the next thing I have to do? What's the next thing I have to decide? Uh, so yeah, survival action right. step. And and I yeah, I I never thought of it as an out of body experience till you just said that. For me, I always called it functioning mode, and everybody probably experienced it it's differently or similar. I'm not sure. You know. Um, but it's, it's beautiful how you describe it, because I can only imagine how intense and difficult and painful it would have been for you to come back into your whole self and, and feel all the feels that came up, you know? So, um, I would like to know if that's okay with you, please always, uh, you know, let me know if that's too much or you don't want to share that's absolutely okay. But how did your two and a half year old boy cope with that when you know like how do you explain something like that to a two and a half almost three year old at that stage well I think he was right on that cusp of just being 
young enough to not understand, but old enough to feel that something had changed Mm -hmm. and shifted because I would watch him and he, first of Mm -hmm. all, he was by my side all the time. Like he was, that was already sort of part of our relation though. I will, we'll step back a little bit. My ex-husband was a pilot in the Marine Corps. So he was gone Mm -hmm. all the time, always deployed, always in training. So me and my son were little partners in crime. (laughs) I would always Mm -hmm. say that it's, him and I against the world, right? It was just him and I. No. And so we were always yeah. close and we always, you know, just were together. And so I think it was also mm. natural for him to sort of be by my side. Mm. Um, you know, his dad wasn't really connected and super involved, even when he was home, mm. unfortunately. So that's a different yeah. situation. But um, but I would watch him and I could tell that he was just watching me. He was just waiting yeah. for those. If I had a good day, he had a good day. If I had a hard day, yeah. he had a hard day. And when I say a hard day, it wasn't like meltdowns or things. I could just tell he would yeah. just sort of tense up or clam up. He was a very yeah. gregarious child. He was a very independent yeah. child. And all of a sudden yeah. he would be my little shadow, right? And playing mm-hmm. games on his own or doing things on his own weren't really what he yeah. wanted to do. And so, which was difficult because there was part of me, the mother in me, knew that I needed to figure out how to be the best mom to him, right? Like he was just a little boy. It was not his fault that his sisters died. Mm -hmm. He needed me to be a good mom. But there was also this other part of me that understood that I could only show up so well because Mm -hmm. I was devastated. So I was Mm -hmm. constantly struggling with this guilt because I couldn't Mm -hmm. be the mom that he needed but with the reality that I didn't know how to be the mom that he needed. And not that I wasn't trying and not that everything Mm. fell apart. Um, But he was too intuitive. He knew. Mm. And I knew that he knew. (laughs) Like you couldn't, you couldn't pretend like you you didn't know. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, And so I think that's also why I poured myself so quickly into figuring out how am I going to do this? So, and I realize, you know, I've been in the grief world for a long time. My girls, their Mm. birthday in June will be 15 years. Okay. That's a decade Mm -hmm. and a half. This is not my Mm -hmm. first rodeo. This is not new to me. Mm -hmm. Not only have I worked on my own healing and my own heart, but I've worked with thousands of clients since then. Like the grief world is something that I'm very acquainted with. The healing world is very, something I'm very acquainted with. But looking back to those early days, I remember pouring myself into this urgency of figuring out how do I get myself whole as quickly as possible because my child depends on it. Yeah. And it wasn't until I started choosing healing because I I needed it. I yeah. needed healing in my life. Yeah. That one, I, I could save some of that guilt energy right? I wasn't being a bad mom. I was just grieving. Mm. Okay. Grief isn't a bad thing to do. Grief is a very real thing to do. Just Mm. because something is difficult and painful doesn't necessarily mean it's traumatic. It can become traumatic, but I wasn't traumatizing my child because I was grieving. And the more Mm. I poured myself into healing, the more I realized that he was going to be okay. As long as I was moving myself towards being okay, he was going to be okay. Although yeah. we have a running joke in our house where no, my children don't like granola bars. <laughs> and it's because <laughs> when he was little and I was grieving, whenever he'd say, mama, I'm hungry. I'd say, get a granola bar. And it oh became this gosh. thing at that time in our life. We're like, two <laughs> men granola bars. Like, I don't, I want something yeah. else than a granola bar. So we just don't really have granola bars in our house anymore. <laughs> I get that. But I love my that point story. is, it's yes. It's nice when you have huge stories coming out of that as well it makes so much sense yeah Yeah. well and and here's the reality because grief can be so difficult like what's not sugar-coated it's brutal right there are aspects of it that are so confusing and so painful and so difficult and it is a life-changing experience Mm. how our life changes we get to decide and I think that's the part of it nobody tells us yeah we do get to decide how we are changed We don't get to decide that we're changed. We're changed one way or another, but we do get a say in how that change takes place. Mm. And so for me to look back and think granola bars are the most traumatizing experience that comes out of that feels like 
then you did. That's okay. The wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. can we can recover from that, right? We we can yeah. make it through the other side of that because I also know it yeah. could have been so much worse. It could have gone yes. a different way. It could have had different ramifications. Um, I've seen those ramifications. We all and and I'm not saying that there wasn't deep work to go through. I'm not saying there wasn't hard things for me to work through. But when I'm talking specifically in reference to my child, he was okay. He still is okay. Yeah. He's doing so well in life. How old is he now? Because they're 17, 18? 17, 17 and a yeah. half. Yeah. yeah. Driving and working and planning for college and all the things. That's um, my next step as a mama bear. Yeah. My older one will start <laughs> driving at met. the end of this year. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not sure if I'm ready. <laughs> it's both uh, amazing, exciting. It is phenomenal though to see what our kids can really do. Yeah. They really, you yeah. know, he's he's a good kid. He's there's so many yeah. things about him that I'm like, oh, thank goodness that, you know, and it's not, there's, I think part of it, I look back and I, I'm grateful that I made certain choices and moved mm -hmm. forward in certain ways, but also some of it you can't control and like his natural personality, his yeah. ability to adapt, like that's just mm -hmm. in him. Like I didn't, I didn't necessarily do that. So I think there is a combination of nature versus yeah. nurture but i do think our choices matter absolutely i've seen yes. oh 100 yeah um i couldn't agree so that's what yeah may i just ahead. ask rachel so going back to the timeline of all of that happening at at what stage um did you decide to separate from your husband oh How that was years later decide? we've only been divorced for about five years now so Okay. There was a, yeah, a very specific incident that I'm not going to get into details about that happened of about, and we don't need to. Uh, yeah, six or seven weeks after the girls died that I felt like mm -hmm. a huge shift. And so mm -hmm. just very, to be clear, I think there's a lot of rhetoric and a lot of messaging around child loss, infant loss, teenage mm -hmm. loss, anything between parents that yeah. says if parents lose a child, their chances of divorce skyrocket. I just want to be very clear to anyone out there who is going through the death of a child at any age under any circumstance and is worried mm -hmm. about their marriage. The death of a child does not cause a divorce. The mm -hmm. death of a child, all it does is it emphasizes, it puts light on all mm -hmm. of the cracks oh. that are already there. So if you have a marriage oh, that you can work through things, then you will work through things. If you mm -hmm. have a marriage that's already on the rocks, grief just makes it more on the rocks. But the death of a child does not cause a divorce. So you don't need to walk around afraid that you're now also going to lose your marriage if you've lost a child. It's not true. It's an exaggerated statistic that gets warped and, and messed up. If there's already this problems is... in your marriage, those problems are going mm -hmm. to show up. Okay. If there's not then those they're not going to manufacture problems out of nowhere right it is, is possible to get through grief together just say, yeah right and i know tons of couples who've done it and not only did yeah. they get through it they're they're amazing they're tight they're close yeah. they're they brought them even closer they're together like, yeah yes they sort of like their connection just deepened and i don't want that to sound like I'm telling you that grief makes your relationship better. I'm not saying that at all. Okay. Grief is hard. It can, it can yeah. cause a lot of problems, but the fact is you don't need to have that little voice inside of your head telling yeah. you that now that you've gone through the most imaginable, you know, an imaginable mm -hmm. loss in your life, that now your marriage might be in trouble because some weird yeah. statistics from the world are, are telling you that that's true. Yeah. It's not true. And my marriage, Thank I'm you. not Thank divorced you. today because yeah. my babies died. I'm divorced because we had a very difficult relationship that had a lot of flaws that were completely separate from my baby's mm -hmm. dying. But when they died, their ability to tolerate, your ability to cope, your ability to persevere. Mm -hmm. And we even lasted a whole decade. It's not like it just ended overnight. Yeah, We lasted a whole yeah. decade more until enough was yeah. enough. But they were separate incidences. Yeah. I do not blame the death Which, of my daughters yeah. on the failure of my marriage. I just wanted I to say that it is so beautiful because so many people may even go to the length of um, using that as an explanation of their breakup rather than seeking 
accepting the faults in their own relationship. And I think it says so much about you to highlight that fact. I, I literally just want to pull, put it on a billboard because as you said, you know, like I, I heard the same thing. My brother, unfortunately, my eldest brother went through the same thing. Um, unfortunately, he lost the daughter and, you know, their marriage did break up after that. And also not straight after, you know, they went on for another few years and had another two uh, daughters after that. Yet um, when you just said that, I have to say, I've never heard anybody say it in those ways. And it means so much to me. So I want to thank you because it also brought some healing to me hearing that. Uh, even though for me it was just the outer perspective I'm just a sister here you know and not the one involved in that situation so uh, it's really really beautiful because I'm also very very close to his daughters in particular the, the youngest one so the second one after the one that passed away and this brings me so much healing and so much I don't know, release uh, to hear that in those words. I've never, ever thought about it that way because we were told back then, oh, you know, it's just part of the statistics. 80% of couples were split up after that. That was the statistic we were told back then. So, Which, I by the way, there's actually that. no, like, we don't know where that statistic came from. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I, <laughs> I just can't find say, it I anywhere, right? That. No. Yeah, well, and I, think I feel terrible. that a lot of people might sit here listening to this and really needed to hear just that one thing you know I mean there's so much so many golden nuggets already but that was really really important um and I, I want to thank you for highlighting that so um where well grief is so that... hard like it's yeah. so hard I feel like it's easy for a bunch of other hard things to get lumped in with it mm. right and yeah. it Correct. isn't everything in our life isn't connected to our grief even mm. though everything in our life might be affected by our grief yeah yeah Incredible. it's important to I know the it. difference between what is affected and what is connected yeah because it gives us power to make different choices mm. I love it I love it I want to highlight everything you say it's just so beautiful <laughs> I can tell you've done so much work in this space already it really it really speaks to my heart so please bring us to the point along the timeline whatever else you want to share where um you know Crystal came into the picture of noticing you sitting there sipping a cup of tea every time when you needed some downtime how did it all develop into something so incredible and it's such an <laughs> amazing business that you run today? Yeah. This is this well, is I, I think, yeah, I think I said before that Crystal is my sister. So if I if I didn't say that before, I want to reiterate that mm -hmm. Crystal is my sister. I'm the oldest of three girls and Crystal is the baby, but we're three girls in three years. So we're pretty close together. Um, yeah, but she would come to visit me. My middle sister has kids. And so you know, we both have children and they're all, all about the same age. So at the time, you know, my middle sister was overwhelmed with her own children yeah. or she would have probably been there as well. I mean, she was wonderfully supportive. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that she wasn't supportive, but yeah. Crystal, because she didn't have kids that, you know, doesn't have children, she was able to have a little bit more freedom. And she used that freedom to just come and spend time with me and just be in the mm -hmm. house, right? Nothing specific. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of being around, she was watching how I was coping or lack of right how I wasn't yeah. coping yeah. and it was her observation as I had you know my third cup of tea in my hand in a single morning mm. seeing how he was he was becoming or had become really the first thing that brought me any sort of consistent comfort mm. I tried a lot of stuff and some things would work a little bit here and not there and partially work you know support groups and therapy and exercise mm. and I, I but just about exercise myself to death and realize that mm. is not a solution to grief um yeah but she was the one that first realized what was working right instead of what wasn't working you know, she's like Rachel you mm. really depend on your tea and I was like you're absolutely right I do and it was her yeah. suggestion like what if we could find something that we could put in your tea that would actually help you feel better and that sort of birthed this idea of what's available that we can actually mm. implement into a warm, soothing tea ritual that would actually have grief support benefits. 
And yeah. long story short, that led to us creating an entire line of teas that actually support mm. the physical toll that your body experiences under the processing of grief. Because grief is yeah. long, it's not short, it's complex, mm. it's not simple, and it's physical, not just emotional, which I think is a piece of information mm. that is not talked yeah. about enough. And yes. so much of our grief experience is us disassociating. It's us leaving our body, like you said, to survive, mm. to cope, yeah. to do the next thing, to keep the world moving. But our bodies are so intuitive and they're so smart. They won't yeah. let us stay in our bodies when we're in that much pain. And so we mm. leave. But the healing and the comfort and the soothing and the restorative actions that we have to take through our pain can only happen if we re-enter our bodies. We have to get reconnected to what's going on physically. We have to listen to the physical cues that our bodies are telling us. Yeah. And so by creating these keys that actually address specifically the physical toll of grief on our body, I was able to reintegrate, right? To embody myself again, instead of having to leave to survive, I was able mm -hmm. to come back and start addressing mm -hmm. what is going on in my body. How can I support myself? What okay. can I do to help move not just my heart and my mind, but my actual body through the pain of my loss so that on the other end, I wasn't just a shell of myself because I realized mm -hmm. if I was going to make it through, willpower was not going to be enough. Positive thinking was not going to be enough. Keeping a gratitude list not going to be enough. I needed Can something I that was actually for one second. Build me up. Yes. Yeah, no. I, I just wanted to pause you and ask you something directly about this, what you just said. Um, the gratitude is not enough really, really touched me quite deeply because I was always a huge believer in gratitude and that gratitude brings you back into the present moment, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we all know about that. And I also learned in grief how much this becomes theory when you're going through emotions like that. I, I think it took me at least 18, if not 24 months before I could actually think about practicing gratitude again. It wasn't that I wasn't grateful for things around me, for support, for my children, of course, you know, after Rob died. Yet... I also noticed that I really struggled, I'm being completely transparent here, I really struggled with the concept of actively practicing gratitude, which is such a different thing of just being grateful for something, but practicing it, journaling about it. Like, you know, I really struggled with that. I felt it was such an irony for me when people suggested that. I'm like, do you know what we're talking about here? Like, you know, my husband died. It's not that... And, uh, you know, in your case, your, your twin daughters, it, it's just something I think is really important to address that it's for anybody listening to this who might have not ever dealt with grief or loss to please not suggest that as a solution because it really feels a bit like <laughs> yeah. a slap yeah. in the face. When no, you well, that. I think the messaging is, is all wrong because I think the minute yeah. we tell grievers to practice gratitude, we're yeah. insinuating, even if we don't mean to, okay, even if we're well-intentioned, we're insinuating that somehow grief is a gratitude problem, that grief mm. can be solved with gratitude. Yeah. And the truth is grief is not a gratitude problem. Grief mm -hmm. and gratitude can live in the same space. I remember being yeah. overwhelmingly grateful when Aubrey and Ellie died for the medical staff, yeah. for the family that supported yeah. us, for all of the... The situation that we had, like we happened to be, you know, in the military and they covered, we had $650,000 yeah. of medical bills that were covered by our Marine Corps insurance, right? Like those yeah. things were not lost on me. You know, I had yeah. a beautiful, healthy baby boy. I, there were lots of things I could go on for days, lots of things I, I was grateful you. for, yeah. but none of those things put my babies back in my arms. So my grief was still very, very present. And I promised myself early yeah. on that I was not going to demand that I somehow remedy my grief with gratitude. And even mm -hmm. with my clients to this day, I the, one of the first things that I tell them is we're going to steer away from this idea that gratitude mm -hmm. is a remedy for grief. 
because it isn't. Grief yeah. is the natural and normal response to loss. It's a representation yeah. of everything that is healthy with us. If we mm -hmm. were not the type of people that can form bonds and relationships and connections and be mm -hmm. healthy humans, then we wouldn't grieve yeah. because loss wouldn't matter to us because we wouldn't be connected mm -hmm. to anything. Right. So yeah. grief is a representation of everything that's right with us, which means mm -hmm. that when we're grieving all of the other things like gratitude and hope and positivity and all that doesn't just go out the window because we didn't mm -hmm. do anything wrong. We're not misbehaving. We don't have a perspective mm -hmm. problem. We just yeah. lost something that we wanted to keep and it hurts and pain as much as we would love to, but our, our culture loves to make pain, um, a problem, right? It's mm -hmm. an illness. It's a, yeah. it's a, we need to medicate it or we need to categorize it, or we need a mm -hmm. pill so that the symptoms yeah. go away mm -hmm. instead of addressing the fact that the pain is not a representation of a problem. Grief is a representation of loss. And that doesn't mean that's not difficult. It's horrible. It's the worst, mm -hmm. but it's still yeah. not a problem that has to be solved. Solved. It's something that we need to learn how to process, right? Because mm -hmm. healing comes in the process. There's nothing wrong with us that we have to fix. Yeah. I, I'm so grateful you say that, Rachel. I have, uh, you know, the beautiful Adrian Hinks is a psychotherapist. He comes into the movement, uh, Loving Love After Loss, once a month to talk about things. And the very first topic we addressed was antidepressants and grief, you know, and, and I don't even want to go there. People who are interested in watching that, um, this is the exact title that you can look it up for on a YouTube channel or in the group. But, uh, you know, we often go into wanting to fix something that needs to be processed. You can't fix something that needs your own time frame, and that can be as long as you need it be. You know, like for some uh, society would judge it's too soon, for others society would judge it takes too long. Society hasn't walked in your shoes, so leave society out the door and just trust your heart. Rachel, I'm, I'm very aware we are over time already, but I really do want to share your beautiful business because tell us. Um, in a nutshell, what do you do? Because we will be sharing the links so for anybody who wants to try out your amazing teas. Uh, they can they can certainly find the website underneath the interview. But please give us a bit of a, you know, how did you get started and, and what is there? Talk about your beautiful products, please. Yeah, so we set out on a journey to discover what sort of herbal medicine and natural alternatives mm -hmm. existed in the world that could actually help support me physically and emotionally through the process of grief and our six teas. So there's not just one, there's six teas in our line. Mm -hmm. We're intentionally blended. Each one has a unique blend of herbs. So they're not the same herbs in each tea because we mm -hmm. wanted to be able to address the full spectrum of emotional needs. Yeah. We don't yeah. just have a single emotional need, right? We have many mm -hmm. emotional needs through grief. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer that those needs are not um, linear, right? There, everyone has a unique experience and and just to qualify, no two people grieve alike. Okay. I want to be very clear on that. No two people have an identical grief experience. There's too many differences, too many nuances for any two people to have an identical grief experience. Yeah. But I've been doing this for 15 years now. And in my experience, grievers have much more in common than they have different. So even though there's nuances and uniqueness to all of our grief experiences, we have so much more in common. And those commonalities reveal healing, ways that we can experience healing that work for all of us. And the teas were really about linking that commonality. There isn't a single mm -hmm. person whose heart is broken that cannot benefit from time-tested, safe and effective herbal remedies that actually go to work mm -hmm. in your body to help build you back up from a warm cup of tea that's soothing and comforting and there when you need it every time you need it, whether that's 10 times a day or one time a day, right? What I loved mm. about my tea is at two in the morning when I would wake up and be having a hard time, my tea would be there for me because I didn't have anyone mm. to call. Not because I didn't have any support in my life, but sometimes people have to sleep, right? Like the people mm. in our lives cannot be there for us 24 seven, 365 days a year because they're just human yeah. beings. And no matter how much they love us and how much they support us, there's a limitation. And so my tea, build in all the gaps 
of the limitations of the people in my life, even though they were wonderful and so supportive, right? The tease yeah. became symbolic of the steps yeah. I was taking towards my healing journey. They represented that I believe that healing was possible. Yeah. Which is yeah. another message that we're told, right? Healing's forever. It's a permanent state. Yeah. But it isn't. It, not if you don't want it to be. It can be. It, yeah. it can be forever. Yeah. But if you don't want it to be, there are ways yeah. that you can find relief mm. and recovery and healing. And so the tea sort of combines the ritual with the herbs, with the mm. symbolic gesture of saying, if I want life after loss, I can find it. Yeah. I love it because I, I did read through all your descriptions as well. I had a very good look on your website and I just loved the different emotions that you address and the different blends. And I was like, oh, I want this. Oh, I want this. Oh, I want this. Oh, yeah. so many different. <laughs> oh, I'm like, oh, well, the truth God, is they were just, so... the way that we created them was based on yeah. what I needed at the time. Like at first I was just so sad. Which so we made a tea that helps so authentic. lift your spirits. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, I was yeah. truly just so devastated. Yeah. But then I went through this season of, of anger, of just mm. frustration, of resentment. Mm. And even though that was short-lived for me, it was intense. And I remember telling my sister, mm. we need to make a tea that's going to help me with this anger because I don't know, yeah. I don't know what to do with it. And then very quickly, yeah. I moved into sort of this season of um, bargaining and which I don't like that term because I feel like it goes to the stages of grief and I don't believe in the stages of grief I think that's too linear but it still was this era of sort of paranoia like mm. please don't let anything else bad happen in mm. my life yeah. I don't think I could get through something else I think I can yeah. maybe muster up enough strength to get through this but if anything mm. else happens I don't think I'm going to be able to, to deal with it. And yeah. I found myself feeling very limited and very worried and very anxious mm. and very fearful. And so we developed yeah. a tea for that. And then after that, yeah. it moved into this sort of progression of like, okay, I, th I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready to attempt this journey, but I don't know what it's going to be like. And I'm worried mm. and right. And then we just kept evolving and evolving. And so it wasn't, mm. I didn't consult like science or psychology I just mm. asked for what I needed. And every time I would tell I my that. sister, hey, let's work together to come up with this mm. next step. And before we knew it, we had this set of six T's that really yeah. spanned every area. And I've been working with mm. grieving people, like I said, for over 15 years now. Yeah. And we haven't missed a, uh, there's no hole, right? I haven't ever mm. had a client where I'm like, oh man, we don't have a T for that. Yeah. Those six yeah, T's really do this. sort of, <laughs> yeah, cover those mm you know, base yeah. modes of healing yeah. and they meet which you. Which one's your favorite? At. Oh gosh. Sorry. That's like asking me which child is my favorite. Oh, no, I no, love no, them no. all. But I will say okay, if the one I drink question. the most, yes. Yeah. Is either drink is either discover joy, which is the one that we created for to lift your spirits when you're sad, or find yeah. strength, which is the one we created yeah. to build self-confidence and perseverance. So those two are these I also your best back. sellers no as a matter of fact they're not no. seek peace and achieve clarity are our best sellers so oh, seek wow. peace was created for rest and realize or i'm sorry yeah. seek peace was created for um seek peace with our coconut chai and it has liver support herbs mm. in it and it's actually created for anger and emotional mm. expression and then mm. achieve clarity is our vanilla earl gray that's created for mm. like grief fog and cognitive it like helps your brain it helps you think it helps you make decisions yeah. and all those things are super important so yeah it's so interesting yeah. but none of the teas are not well received I mean everyone loves yeah. all of them but for different reasons and you see people yeah. it changes right at, at a time they'll prefer one and then they'll move to it to another and they're meant to yeah. be mixed and matched and used as needed uh, which I love yeah. I love seeing that evolution and they're they're meant mm. to be tools I I have no preferences you prefer one tool over another by all means mm, like you absolutely. use what you, you get That's to decide I love that you've got this variety to choose from and uh last but not least you also say that you do you do work with people who are grieving as well is I, that correct is that a one-on-one -on -one? Yeah. is that a group setting how do you or do you do, yeah do you i both? have i have a coaching program um that i developed myself because i felt like there was a a hole 
in the grief mm. community, right? There were oh, some yeah. things not being addressed. And I believed that I could build a more effective yeah. path. Yeah. And so I now have a 12 week coaching program that mm. my clients love and is getting results and is rich mm. and meaningful. And um, I believe it's filling that hole that I intended it to fill. Yeah. And so I, important too. I would love for you to share whatever you can, you know, about your coaching program, about your teas, you know, your Instagram handles, whatever you want to share where people can connect with you, where people can find your products, your services. I will be sharing all of that in the interview below. And Rachel, I would love for you uh, if there's any final words that you would like to share some beautiful wisdom you've shared so much today in terms of wisdom and I I, I couldn't be happier that you came and, and shared so openly with us I took so many golden nuggets away from you so are there any last words that you would like to wrap this interview up with and please the stage is all yeah. yours I'm terrible at last words because I always have last <laughs> words I think <laughs> yeah I think that um looking back in my experience the one thing I wished someone would have told me that they didn't tell me mm -hmm. is that grief always takes longer than you want it to. And every time you think you can't do it, ask for help. Mm -hmm. Because it requires support. That does not an indictment yeah. that you're somehow incapable or somehow mm -hmm. inadequate you don't need to just tough it out. You don't need to keep it to yourself. I promise you yeah. everything you are thinking and feeling, everyone else is thinking and feeling too. You're just not saying it out loud and no one else is either. So we all feel like yeah. it's just us. Yeah. You're not broken. You're not ruined. Grief is mm. not permanent. I think that's so important. But the way to get to life after loss is a process it doesn't time does not heal mm. all wounds it doesn't magically take place the stars do not align and suddenly you realize why all of this yeah. had to happen we mm. have to take it upon ourselves to create meaning out of our loss there isn't some inherent good in the bad that happens to us we determine that good by how we respond that's up to us because it can be ju just as much for our bad I, I don't, I've never liked that language around somehow the things that hurt us the most are all are for our, our good. They're not. They can be absolutely yeah. for our bad, but we can decide that in our response to those things that what could have been so bad for us yeah. has, has life in it. Mm -hmm. We get to choose the life. And it's a bit of a fight sometimes. It takes mm. a lot of rest. It does mean we need to lean on others. And then sometimes we have to push ourselves in ways that we never expected. But there's fruit at the end, right? It's not all for nothing. It's not in vain. And mm. I think it's worth remembering that whatever we lost, whether it was a loved one or our health or a dream, a child, a spouse, a sister, a brother, mm. We can love them in our healing more than we ever could love them in our hurting. And if we give ourselves permission to let our life of healing represent them, mm. we get a sense of freedom that we can never have if we decide that the only representation of our love can be our pain. Yeah. I love this so much. And I literally want to leave that as the final words because that is so incredible and uh i think this is a message that the world really needed to hear a lot of the things that you shared here today so i cannot thank you enough thank you thank you thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing here so openly and also in particular for the most amazing teas that you shared to the world to help with the healing that is so much needed thank you for being here today Thank you for everything you shared. And uh, this is Rachel and Marie signing off. Bye for now.